I want to talk, talk about risk transform on a class of non doubling manifolds, and this is a joint work with Andrew Hassel and our joint PhD students, Daniel Nix. And let me start with the abstract. Abstract is a little bit long, uh, but what we want to really understand from here, so we we try to here understand the risk transform on manifolds M. I will talk a little bit more about this in a minute. And we consider connected sum of finite number of ends of some specific form. And this ends has uh, some asymptotic dimensions. And the most interesting case is where uh, these dimensions are not equal because then Riemannian manifolds is not a doubling space. And the main result which we want to discuss here is a result which says that in this setting, risk transform is bounded between, for all P between one and minimum of MI. So this is if and only if results. And in particular, if we take dimension, if we include dimension two, then the optimal range is the interval one, two. So maybe instead of uh, just uh, trying to digest this abstract, let me try to draw a, a picture of what we're considering here. So we've got, say, two copies of R2, right? And we make some compact connection from one end to, to the other. Right, so, so that's kind of manifolds, uh, types of manifolds which we are interested in here. Uh, sometimes you, you can kind of believe that this is a model of earth and heaven, right? When you've got a kind of like a compact, uh, uh, narrow way of good deeds uh, from one place to the other. Right. Uh, unfortunately, here you've got kind of equally uh, likely possibility of being demoted from heaven to to earth. Right. So this should be kind of the same same dimension here. Right. So these are kind of the plane connected with a plane. But we are even more interested in the case when the dimension are not the same. Right. So we consider our earth to be here. Say just. Uh, R2, but then you want to consider object which is kind of asymptotically one dimensional. So it's a, as a manifold, it has the same dimension too, so we can connect one to the other, but because this is a cylinder asymptotically, this dimension is here, uh, it's like, say, let's call it R1 connected. So this would be an example of R1 connected with R2. And um, one of the uh, interesting feature here is, uh, which is kind of like maybe some kind of uh, really interesting point, is that uh, if in this setting we don't, we lose doubling condition. So that's uh, somehow quite a crucial uh, feature in all uh, analysis of singular integral operators and we don't have it here. So that's kind of like a one a bit of a difficulty and uh, a point which, uh, which is kind of one of main point of interest here, right? Okay, so uh, that's, that's a little bit of a picture. So I will not go back to, to exact statement. I will just kind of repeat the statement from abstract again. So let me just start a little bit uh, about the definition. So risk transform, so what, what we said, so if we have complete Riemannian manifolds, right, then we can just find Laplace Beltrami operator just via quadratic form using uh, a gradient, right? Mm. And uh, with such defined Laplace Beltrami operator, we can define corresponding risk transform, right? So Basically, the question is where can we bound the gradient, norm gradient of function f by, say, square root of 
uh, Laplacian of function f. So for p equals 2, such property is automatically true, right? This is kind of just a definition of the, our operator. For other p, it's kind of interesting uh, problem. So basically we want to ask for what range of p Bridge transform is bounded, acts as a bounded operator on space LP. Okay, so one thing that, that I talk here about doubling conditions. So I guess one of point of interest here in all this uh, discussion here is that we don't have doubling condition. So I guess if it's one of main of point of interest, then I should define it, right? So Essentially, doubling condition says that the ball of radius 2r and ball of radius r has comparable dimension, right? And uh, here it's essentially not the case. So if we just go back to, to this uh, picture here, right? If you take a ball of big ball of radius r here, right? So starting somewhere here, if you take a big ball of radius r, right? You will end up with, oops will end up with something like that, right? This is R. And this will be have, for large R, this will have volume more or less of, of R, right? If you take a double and you go on the other side, you've got R here, but on this side, the, the volume will be R square. So from R to R square, you can see that taking bigger and bigger R, the doubling condition fails. Kind of not, very dramatical way, but it fails. And it's produced a lot of uh, trouble here. Okay, so I should say a little bit of, of uh, uh, risk transform, right? So this is a classical problem. The first paper starts with, with Marcel Ries, uh, published in Mathematische Zeitschrift in 1928. So it's like uh, in eight years, we'll have 100th anniversary of this, uh, uh, research area and uh, significance is kind of like a definition of Sobolev spaces, fear of PDE. So in a sense, you would kind of like you consider say Laplacian F, right? And you wonder if it means that you can calculate dxi square of F say separately. And the answer is given by risk transform is that, well, Mostly, mostly yes. So you can kind of like, you can calculate, if you can calculate Laplacian of F, you can calculate the derivatives of your function uh, as well. That's kind of a simplification, right? But, but that's, uh, that's one of the uh, interesting points here. So the other point is that this is a classical example of uh, calderon zygmunt operators of singular integral uh, mm, operators, right? And um, the, because of this, uh, the topic really developed uh, somewhere in, in 70s after we get the calderon zygmunt decomposition and kind of way of treating uh, singular integral operators, right? Uh, there are also some natural uh, mm, uh, generalization of the topic, right? Uh, Probably something which I should also mention is that this risk transform, so if we look at this nabla, say delta to minus one half, right? Then if we define this as a L1 norm, right? This could be a good definition of uh, Hardy spaces, right? Acting on, uh, of, so yeah, that's, that's a good definition of Hardy spaces. So that's kind of one more significance of, of connection with with a big subject of Hardy spaces, HP spaces, and BMO, and so on. Um, so here I want to say that the object of, of uh, manifolds with, N, uh, with Ns, I said here was introduced, but it was really reintroduced. So it was kind of the topic is, is uh, a bit older than that. Uh, it appears already in Davies and some other papers from, from that period, but uh, uh, interestingly, I mean, that's, that's uh, what, what uh, 
good history, maybe let me take this way, good history of, of, of subject can be found in, in Gregorian and South Coast papers with some of the co-authors. And they uh, establish a very nice heat kernel bounds uh, for this class of objects. Unfortunately, we are not able to use this heat kernel bounds for harmonic analysis. For, so for a question like a risk transform, which kind of like we, we think that it should just follow after you've got a, a good kernel bounds, it's not working like that. So it's the problem is that, that with uh, South of course Gregorian estimates, we have problems with taking derivatives with kind of so, so it's, it's essentially there's a pro big problem with, um, with whole machinery, which is kind of like quite surprising because if you, if you think about classical kind of uh, uh, risk transform to, uh, estimates for manifolds, if in case of doubling, when you get good estimates for the heat kernel, pretty much everything is automatic. Here, for good reason, it's, it's not quite like, like that. So, a few. So I, I already said that that uh, at least in range for one and two for classical situation where uh, we have doubling condition and Gaussian bounds, the corresponding Hiskert kernel is bounded between one and two. It's still quite difficult question of what happens when p is bigger than two, but at least we have uh, estimate between one and two. I could kind of I think I exaggerate here with. Uh, strong with, with weak inequality, this should be a strong inequality, but we also have a weak type one one here, right? And um, so in particular, this first result is kind of like quite a significant result for risk transform of manifolds, but it's not uh, useful for us because there's assumption of doubling here. So another result which I want to mention is a, a Caron Coulomb Hassel result. Which, act, which, which works for copies, two copies or many copies of connected RN. So when all the asymptotic dimensions are equal, then manifolds is, uh, still has doubling conditions. So it somehow simplifies the, the, uh, the theory, but uh, already this interesting feature appears here that the risk transform is bounded if and only if uh, P is between one and dimension of the whole space. And I should say that uh, there's a result of Caron, which consider um, non-doubling situation where he has result, but his results only works between a range of n. So he doesn't, he's not able to go to L1, right? Uh, and not able to get a weak type one, one. So that's, that's, uh, that's uh, a kind of missing point, uh, which we could kind of add here. So this is our results. So pretty much in our results, we consider this uh, number of manifolds with ends. Here in this first uh, results, which I want to mention, we consider all dimensions to be bigger than three. So there's actually kind of like uh, quite significant difference uh, between dimension bigger than three and then dimension two and one. Pretty much if you want to think about this, I will say about something like this a little bit more, but pretty much if you want to think about this, it's connected with the uh, manifold being transient or recurrent. This actually kind of interestingly enough change a lot in the situation. So, so this assumptions that NI is bigger or equal than three is not uh, something uh, insignificant. It's not just technicality, there's somehow really significant difference. Okay, so the uh, thing which, which I want to mention is that uh, uh, it's nice and uh, to have some kind of uh, place to experiment. And there's actually a nice way to experiment with uh, these results here. So you could kind of consider risk transform in one dimension, but it's risk transform in one dimension for operator for radial part of operator acting on RD space. So I kind of like for one dimensional space, I kind of change notion from, from of dimension from D to N, right? And uh, the little result which, which I obtained with, with Andrew Hassel uh, and which uh, asks about boundless of, range of boundless of risk transform for 
different dimension here. In this situation, because we kind of consider really one dimensional case, this is possible to consider all dimensions, uh, including uh, uh, non, uh, not natural numbers, but, but any, any numbers between one and infinity. And there's kind of like an interesting feature which, which you can see here. So for dimensions bigger than two, which, which kind of we consider here, the range of P should be indeed between one and D. For D equals two, then the range should be just going to two. And for D between one and two, we also have a kind of a smaller range, but, uh, but the range is, is uh, somehow described by some, uh, say, conjugate, actually, if you think about it as a conjugate for two, to P, two dimension bigger than, than two. Uh, I want to mention this, this is a kind of like, so in this case, actually, it's, uh, still doubling situation, but it's, it's uh, making one dimensional calculations kind of helps you to, to think about, uh, about the result uh, and about kind of helps you to make some conjectures and, and so on. It's also to, so a little bit more of a description, right? So uh, we kind of like, we, we think here about considering real line, right? And, but we've got a real line where we kind of connect point minus one and glue it to one. And on both sides, we kind of consider uh, Laplacian, right? So we've got a kind of on the one side, we've got a Laplacian for n dimension. On the other side, we've got a Laplacian on n dimension. So this is a kind of like a model of, of one dimensional model of a manifold with n, which we want to discuss here. And you actually look at this equation, you kind of, you look at the thing and you will know that, that solutions will be, uh, if you look to, to resolvent solution will be given in some uh, Bessel, in terms of Bessel function of this or other kind. And uh, I, uh, yeah, so this is what, what, what I'm saying here. So if it's a modified Bessel function and you will kind of, uh, you will just use a the theory of ODE to, to solve the equations. You will know that you have two solutions with a little bit of algebra and kind of simple uh, things. You will get a formula for, for the resolvent uh, of such operator for this one dimensional model. And, uh, ah, okay, and here I've, I already got, so this should be Z prime and Z and Z prime, right? Uh, and uh, this actually, so this is a bit, so this is not a whole kernel. The whole kernel is, is somehow a, a, a bit more uh, complex, but this is a part which is, different from what I would say this uh, standard uh, operator acting on, uh, on RN. And there's kind of like an interesting feature of this, this bit, which kind of uh, gives you a little bit of, of expectation what you actually should expect uh, in a whole situation. So let what, what I want to kind of stress here, and this, this will be a similar situation, but this part of, of the formula, the, which is kind of play essential role in whole discussion, is actually kind of a simple because if it's of rank one, right? So we've got here one function of z and one function of z prime. And the, this, this is how our kernel is, is, is concentrated. So, so just main point of the proof, right? So because we cannot work with uh, heat kernel bounds from Grigory and Sal, of course, because we are not able to calculate gradient. So we have to move to uh, resolvent. Here, with the way in which we calculate resolvent, we are able to obtain, we are able to calculate gradient of the resolvent. And that's uh, uh, the main point here why we have to use uh, rather resolvent than, than the heat kernel. And uh, so the main here issue is to calculate resolvent. So we, we use a simple formula here, which we kind of get a uh, risk transform in terms of, of gradient of resolvent. And that's, uh, that's uh, somehow essential point. So 
in a construction of resolvents, we use kind of like uh, a little bit of, of, uh, of a lemma, which pretty much gives us resolvents to any nicely compactly supported function, right? So we can kind of calculate estimates for resolvent if we have fixed compactly supported uh, function. And these are estimates which we have here. Basically what, what we do here, yeah, we, uh, this this uh, yeah this this point here is is, uh, is is somehow crucial. One thing which which I want to mention here, if I still have a bit of time, yes. Yeah, so it's uh, that um, this 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 lemma somehow also help us to produce quite a significant uh, function. So we we've got the. On this manifold with ends, uh, when dimension is bigger than three, right? So which we, the first case which we consider here. So with n i bigger than three, we've got an object like a, the space of a harmonic. Let me say it this way: the space of bounded harmonic functions is uh, not just one dimensional, but uh, number of harmonic functions, right? So if I kind of go to, to this example once again, right? So if I connect now R3 with R3, I could talk about Brownian motion kind of wandering about the space, right? Which is kind of related to, to my Laplace Beltrami operator on this object. And I was, I can talk about the probability that my particle escaped to infinity by one end, not the other. And if you can think about it, this function will be just function which is close close to one on, on the far away on one end and close to zero on the other end. So you've got a function which is harmonic and which is bounded and which is not constant. And this is kind of like a crucial object in, in this discussion here. You could kind of like uh, derive it from, from the lemma. So what you, what you take, you take a function which is essentially one on one end and uh, compactly supported and zero on the other end, right? So we consider this function phi, which we call, talk about this later on. And from this lemma, you look at Laplacian of phi, and then you look at the uh, inverse of Laplacian of phi and minus phi. And this will be your, if you kind of look a little bit to this, uh, to this lemma, you will kind of discover that kind of taking k to zero, will give you exactly this harmonic function, which is one on the one end and zero on the other end, right? And this function plays crucial role, it's, it's, it's here, right? Plays crucial role in the construction of resolvent. So we need to do something with the resolvent. And uh, the term which, which I told you, show you in one dimensional case, is the term G3, which is down where here. So basically we have here in the parametrics construction for the resolvent, we have here three components. One is just a risk transform or just resolvent on each of end, right? So you just have kind of, uh, you take operator as it is kind of defined on each end, right? And you take uh, resolvent there, this phi i phi, I z prime function are kind of function which cuts uh, your object to, to each end, right? There's end G2, which I don't want to discuss. Uh, it's a little bit technical end. This is just the things which leaves just on the connection between these two manifolds and which is compactly supported. It's essentially kind of like, uh, doesn't play any interesting role. The most interesting part, this one kind of, which is really responsible for the result is this part G3. This is kind of like where we get the restricted range of boundness of risk transform. And this is actually quite interesting object because most interesting feature is that, okay, so we've got our resolvent is a kind of perturbation of resolvent on each end by something which is rank one. So if you think about it, you could kind of have here, you've got really function here like H of Z prime and U of Z, right? This depends on K, right? But that's your kernel of, of, of the resolvent here is an rank one operator. And that's actually kind of like a reason why resolvent is much, much easier 
than heat kernel or anything else, including risk transform, right? Because for a solvent, the kind of the correction is, is a one rank operator, which is easy to understand, right? It's, it's essentially actually much easier than resolvent on each end, right? Which is kind of singular integral operator, which is kind of like, I mean, which is a, a say kind of convolution like operator, right? And here we've got a very simple operator of, of uh, rank one type. And that's, that's why the analysis is, is possible. And so this is what, what, uh, what I say here. And uh, interestingly enough, just from, from this simple G1, G2, G3 terms, it's very easy to write down a true resolvent, right? So it's, it's kind of typical situation for a parametrics construction where you just construct a, a couple of first steps and then miracle, your first steps is actually kind of corrected by something which is significantly not of no significance. You've got a really solution, right? That's uh, something which is always surprising. And here, the situation is nice because this things which you have to add to to just standard solution on each end is just a rank one operator. So. I will not go through, through the uh, details of the proof, but you actually get a limited range. So, so the range, which uh, you will see in, on the next slide, the range is really determined by this term G3. This is where risk transform get kind of is, is unbounded. The other terms, as you would kind of expect, right? The other terms is a standard Laplace, but standard risk transform in a sense on each end separately. So the other terms are bounded for all P between one infinity. The obstacle to boundness between one and infinity comes from exactly this, this term. And you're also able to deal with this term to get the boundness for all P between one and minimum of dimension plus getting weak type one one. So this is what, what uh, okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's the proof of, of result one. So let me just, just kind of like to say it once again. So this gives you a boundless of this transform for P between one and minimum of dimension. Ah, and this should be a weak inequality, minimum of dimension MI. And then I want to move to a situation where one end is actually has dimension two. So surprisingly, this is a very different situation. So you would kind of think that, that uh, this should be kind of goes automatically, but it's, it's, it's not, not the case. So we actually kind of spend a lot of time and additional kind of work on this to to get this result as well. So let me just kind of point out to two interesting things here, right? So here the range of P, so here we've got the dimension bigger than three connected with dimension two. And the kind of interesting thing is that the risk transform is bounded only between one and two, but including two. So if you kind of think about this Poincaré kind of property where you kind of, you've got this kind of, uh, people and career kind of is open-ended condition and so on. This is not true for risk transform. Actually, if you add some additional condition and so on, so on, in some cases, the risk transform is also kind of boundless of risk transform is an open-end condition, but not always, right? You can have a situation where actually risk transform is bounded from one to two, including two, and that's it, right? Uh, whereas uh, all over here, you are kind of the boundless where open-ended condition right so that's a one difference now let me just say a, a few where just a few words about why this result is, is so significantly different so the big difference is that uh, here you don't have bounded harmonic functions which are not constant right so if you think about you've got a connection of r2 with r3 right so you've got a kind of like a 
R two n and well, I'm not able to write down R three n. So your manifold is transient. So your Brownian motion will kind of eventually go to infinity, but it will always go to infinity or and R three n, right? So you don't have this other bounded harmonic function. And I would say that this bounded harmonic function is uh, really playing a crucial role in getting this uh, range of, of, of boundness here. So you actually saw something what, what is different here. You have to construct yet another harmonic function, which is not bounded, but which is still kind of like, so it behaves like R2 end, it behaves like logarithm, and on the R3 ends, it behaves like one over R. And this function is, uh, can be used, is, it kind of plays essential role in understanding of, of the limitation of range here. So that's, that's somehow different, uh, different situation. This is actually kind of quite interesting object. It's transient, right? Because you kind of always escape to infinity. It's not a recursive process, but, uh, but it's just transient. So it's kind of like, you know, you kind of, if you're far away from R2, it will take a long time until you find the connection, right? And start to escape to infinity. So this uh, decay here is, 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 uh, is very, very slow. So that's, that's a technical reason. And for, for this, I should say that, okay, but here we've got uh, uh, actually a range of, of questions. So if we, uh, if we go to other situations, like if we have one dimensional ends, or if we have, uh, say, connected with R2, then we don't know what is actually the range of uh, boundness. And it's kind of like our method doesn't really work because of, of uh, additional difficulty, which, which maybe I will mention it it's if I have a bit of time later on, but there's a huge difference between transient and recurrent uh, case because of, 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 of the analysis here. So that's, 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 uh, that's actually kind of like, uh, we actually we answer only part of the question, not, not everything, uh, because we have cases like R1, connected with R3 is still open, right? Uh, I expect, so I expect that the risk transform here is bounded for, I guess, uh, all P judging on one dimensional case, but I, I, I don't know how to prove it. A couple of remarks, so uh, in a sense, uh, doubling condition risk transform. So it's not completely unexpected that uh, you can have boundless of risk transform if uh, without doubling conditions. So there are results of, of Habish and Steger and also as I mentioned Martini, Ottazi, Valarino and, uh, and there are some dimensional three estimates, Stein, Poulon, Miller, Zinkiewicz, uh, uh, which suggests that, that uh, doubling condition is not that relevant. So this is kind of a, a confirming our, our situation. But to some extent, I would say that, that, that our results is a kind of like a first example of, of, exam, of, of a result where we don't have doubling condition, but we have a full description of the risk transform. I should say you have to be a little bit careful because it's a, when there's a spectral gap, then this should be slightly changed. So on, 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 there are some results on, on uh, symmetric spaces and so on, but they not uh, mm, exactly the same, but because there are uh, a spectral uh, gap there. So that's uh, what I should mention here. And let me just finish with a couple of uh, open problems. Uh, <clears throat> So, first problem which I want to mention is uh, spectral multiplier results. So, on the same object, so we, on manifolds of ends, we would kind of like to obtain any form of uh, spectral multiplier results. So, we'd like to have uh, for a nice function, even say smooth, compactly supported function, we would like to know that the spectral multiplier defined by spectral decomposition here, which is easily available here, is uniformly bounded in T. And this is, we don't know how to do it. Uh, it's, uh, 
a little bit of of uh, of difficulty here, and that's some kind of one one more kind of point which which I want to mention here is the heat kernel. So this is kind of like an example of of a situation in which we kind of we, we cannot use this uh, beautiful Gregorian sal cost uh, heat kernel estimates here effectively, right? So you know. From in doubling case, if we have Gaussian bounds, but it's very easy to use kind of Davis idea to extend these bounds to complex time, and this is kind of good enough for lots of uh, applications. Here we have no idea. Say, if you ask about something like P to P norm of this operator, you'd like to have this to be bounded uniformly, right? I have no idea how to how to prove it, right? So that's that's a kind of uh, one a question. The other question I, I, I noticed that, that Alessio Martini is going to talk about uh, a, um, a Grushin type operators. So there is a similar construction on the Grushin type operators, which you could kind of consider. So there's a kind of quite similar situation. So you consider usually in Grushin operators, say you take something like G of X, you say J, just take X squared. But consider a situation where you take on one side x square, on the other side you take x to the power four, and that somehow similar situation we are losing doubling here, right? So this is a nice hyperelliptic operator, so on and so on, but we are losing a doubling here, and uh, I guess I say here that the open question is is like a proving uh, boundless of free transform for p between one and two, but I guess in fact any result from harmonic analysis for this operator would be very, very interesting. We are approaching the end of the time, just a warning. Okay, okay, I am kind of uh, close, to, close to the end. So I, uh, I should mention still a couple of uh, differences between this dimension two and dimension three. So one thing which, which I expect judging on one dimensional case, I would kind of expect that corresponding Hodge projection, right? So if we move to, to Hodge projection, so for case n, minimum of ni bigger than three, I know that, that the, the Hodge projection is not bounded for all p and it's bounded only for, for p between for an i between, uh, say, minimum, if I call this minimum, I call it m, so it's bounded between m and uh, conjugate of m prime, right? So I expect, I don't know how to prove it, that's maybe a problem three, I expect that for minimum dimension number uh, n equals to two, the Hodge projection is still bounded for all uh, p between one and two. So that's, that's a kind of like, like a significant difference. I don't have time, so I'm at the end of time, so I don't have time to talk about this, but Hodge projection is kind of very, very much related to, uh, to risk transform. It actually can be written down in terms of risk transform. I don't have time to talk about this. So a little bit of, of uh, um, bibliography here. So as I say, uh, the subject starts in 1928 from risk to do it in one dimension. Uh, so we are close to 200th anniversary of the subject, right? Uh, and still far away from, from co complete uh, solution. Would kind of think a little bit uh, that, that, you know, that this is a kind of like a project starts 100 years ago and there are so many math mathematicians, right? And we are far away from solving this, this problem. It kind of like with all these mathematicians, like, are you lazy or what? No, I don't know. But, uh, okay, so other kind of important here, which I would kind of, uh, papers which I would mention is, is Grigory and Sal of Cost. Uh, and uh, there's quite a few uh, discussions there. And uh, <clears throat> there is quite good recent survey paper about this setting of manifolds with end by Grigorian, Ishawata, and Sal of Cost. Uh, and yeah, I guess I should uh, stop at this point. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's not just laziness of people, but uh, more and more new settings are included in this discussion. And so uh, the more you know, then the more your questions have. But uh, I think we should, uh, because officially we are at the break time, we should keep the question short. Maybe uh, one or two questions are okay. And please, who has some uh, something to ask to the speaker? Can I make one question? Please. Okay. Professor Cora, like you mentioned before, uh, spectral, the case of spectral multipliers is, is, is open, yes? Uh, with this condition, yes. the support of it. But it's expected that the hormand remilin theorems could be true in this context, hormand remilin for spectral multipliers. Yes. This. yes, I would expect so. I, I expect that this is, this is uh, that this should be should be a valid statement. Okay. With which with which uh, range of p maybe also this limitation. But well, so I mean, in in, in uh, this should be true for for I mean depends on on number of derivatives. So essentially, the number of derivatives probably should be dictated by the largest end and or dimension of whole manifolds and uh, the bigger number of derivatives should give a big, bigger range. So we, yeah, I, th I think there should be a kind of analog of, of uh, Hermann der Michin, as, as well as, as kind of Bochneris analysis and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other short question, please? If not, I would say we thank both speakers of this morning session and I hand over to David for organizatory comments. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the uh, two speakers. Um, yeah, these were very interesting talks. And um, I mean, yeah, there seem to be a lot of uh, open questions here, really. I mean, quite impressive. Um, we have a break now, 20 minutes. And then we continue with the talks of uh, Professor Elfer and uh, Martini. Um, I don't know, are there any questions from um, our participants so far regarding any organizational things? Okay. Otherwise, we're going to... Sorry? Coffee and... <laughs> yes, okay, then uh, please enjoy your coffee. We're going to play our, um, um, uh, our, our um, Book of Abstracts video, and then we'll just uh, meet again in roughly 20 minutes.